Good morning and thank you very much for joining us. I am Yori Folani. Um, okay, um, you know, uh, yesterday the news hit that um, um, uh, Mazin Namdi Kano, uh, leader of the proscribed uh, IPOB, has been rearrested, and um, we'll get to that later in the program. But leading uh, today, uh, we have um, the group managing director of NMPC, Malamele Kolokiari. Um, he's, um, he's the general manager, uh, the you know, group general manager and director of um, NMPC. And uh, a, a very fine morning to you, Malam Kiari. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, Yori Folani in studio here. Now, um, thank you for, you know, also giving us the opportunity. You've been quite busy in the media. Uh, so let's get right to it then. Um, I suppose the most spoken about aspect of goings on in NMPC is uh, NMPC uh, wants to uh, take shares in a private company. And there are many who are saying that, ah, Wait now, who is the bigger? Why would the bigger be taking shares in a private uh, entity? I have heard part of your explanation on this, but perhaps you'll tell us about it, uh, Malam Kiari. Yes, I think it's, um, thank you very much uh, also. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, miscommunication uh, around our strategy. Actually, we didn't start with Dangote Refinery. Uh, three years ago, we realized the issues around energy transition, the choices that people have what businesses must do, what uh, national oil companies need to do to become energy companies as they transit into much more excellence uh, in their performances and realizing the realities around the international business environment. So the basic thing every business is doing today in the oil and gas industry is to expand and uh, expand your portfolio. That means you spread your risk, uh, you take equity in uh, very many businesses so that if one of it works, uh, any one of them that fails to work, the other will compensate for it as a matter of strategy, as a business strategy. So every international national oil company is, is doing this. And this is basic uh, economics that uh, you don't want to put all your basket. In Nigerian parlance, I can say don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, this is a portfolio expansion. We do it both in the downstream, in the midstream, and also in the upstream. Uh, the reason is very, very simple to curtail potential losses that you can't see coming because of the very, very nature of our business today. They're so unpredictable going to the future. A number of things are unfolding, and you just need to have an expanded portfolio. We made that decision three years ago to see how we can expand our portfolio. What this did to us is for us to take equity in very many other businesses, ammonia plants, fertilizer plants, and very many other initiatives that may not necessarily be seen as our direct businesses. And that also, part of our strategy is also to include the refining sector. Uh, today, the NMPC, on behalf of the Federation, owns all the four nation, national refineries in three locations uh, on behalf of all of us. But what, it, what, we have, what we need to do is to expand those portfolio to increase uh, our capacity. Uh, as we propose to go forward with the NMPC refinery along some form of uh, format that we are continuously recommended to this country, that we should have some form of the energy uh, model. Yes, this for decision for the shareholders of this company, but we know that this is the way to go. Uh, as you do this, you need to see other portfolio in the refining uh, business space, in the, in the midstream or industry. Uh, part of it is that we decided that, look, we, we should have some condenser refineries, small-scale condenser refineries that we can take equity in. We have a number of partnerships that are now maturing to all up to the point of taking business decisions or final investment decisions. We are not going to own it 100%. It's part of our portfolio alignment that we're going to work with people so that we have some equity in it. And the other thing is, as a policy of government, we recommended to government that you cannot be an energy-dependent country like us, a resource-dependent country like us, and still have some massive projects. For instance, the families are making up to 50,000 barriers per day and more, mm -hmm. and not have an interest in it. Many countries have tried, independent countries have done this. At the end of the day, you run into risks of putting your energy security on the table. And we didn't think that it's right for government to sit down and watch and see this happens. Uh, while government not doing the business completely itself, it should have a seat uh, on the on the decks on the board of most, most of these uh, ventures. Okay. And there's no better way of doing this than doing it to your national oil companies. Because PID will be a commercial entity, a commercial company that will be guarded by the rules of karma. While you do this, you also know that this company will be owned by majority share by Nigerians. Once you do this, you are going to have semblance of uh, control over the energy security. At least some volume will be made available to you so that you can use it as your strategic stock. Every country has strategic stock. Uh, we are not an exception. Even the most developed of countries have a framework for having strategic stock. In our case, uh, the best way to do it is to get it from your production system 
that you have control over it. You can take it anywhere you want, but obviously you have that. So the combination of both economic interests uh, in these ventures and also the fact that uh, we represent the national interest, we represent the energy security uh, assurances of this country, that when you combine the two, you will have no issue than to, to take some stake in any oil refineries. We're not just talking to Dangote refineries. There are very many other initiatives that we're talking to. I'm not sure, even at this point in time, if Mr. Dam Mr. Aliko Dangote or the Dangote group is actually interested in what we are doing. We actually asked for it. Uh, it wasn't an offer from Dangote Group. We asked for it as a matter of government policy that we need to have a space in this space. Okay. Yes, of course, for a business, it gives them uh, comfort, but the ultimately, uh, it's up to the best national interest. Uh, actually, you've answered, uh, Malam, you've answered the question I would have uh, asked next, which is that um, uh, since it's reported that we'll, NMPC will be going for uh, up to 20% uh, 20, uh, 20 stake in um, the Dangote refinery, I was going to ask, well, uh, how, how agreeable uh, is the whole Dangote you know, uh, board uh, to uh, such a proposal? And um, the matter of um, how are we going to be paying for this? Yes, uh, first of all, let me clarify. Uh, but I can see you. Maybe there's something problem with, uh, with the video. But uh, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, this process started uh, in December last year. So it's not a new process. It took us almost uh, close to now seven months uh, getting this done. Uh, it's a very tedious uh, negotiation. Of course, uh, Dangote will not like to part with 20%. Uh, uh, we negotiated and we think that you need to have substantial stake for you to be on the board of a company so they can have a say on the depths of the the board of this, this company. So that's not what they wanted. They wanted something much lower than this. And, and of course, ultimately, our time sheet now indicates that we're taking 20% equity in this state. Uh, mind you, uh, this industry so, is very, so, very Sorry, Malam. Uh, but does this make us some sort of a, that is the Nigerian government, the Nigerian people, some sort of a, a major stakeholder in uh, Dangote? Refinery. It is. That's that's what it means. You know, we're a company wholly owned by the 200 million shareholders, 200 million Nigerians. You know, is represented by the federal government on behalf of all of us, the state governments, the local governments, and all of you, including me and you. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is we are taking a tax on the Dangote's board, uh, Dangote Refineries board, so that we will have a say on behalf of all of you. And knowing fully well that this is a business that will do well, it will cash out probably in five years. You know, we'll recover all our costs in five years. I will continue to develop deliver value in form of dividends to the shareholders over a long period of time. Okay. And I know for sure that uh, in the next 20 years space, uh, this uh, dividend will continue to come from this business as a value to all of the rest of Nigeria. Okay, let, let, me, let, let me quickly ask this question, although there are other areas, but um, you might have seen it yourself this morning in the punch, you are reported to have said, um, the business and economy page, you are reported to have said that um, actually, you know, uh, petrol should be selling um, for more than 280 uh, naira per liter, uh, as it is, it's 162. Of course, you know Nigerians will always like you to come down. Uh, you say the extenuating circumstances, but uh, clarify that whole matter about um, uh, how you say petrol should ordinarily be costing up to, if not more, than 280 naira per liter. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you must have seen in the media that diesel, I don't know if you buy diesel, I think most people do now, uh, diesel now sells for about 280 naira to the liter uh, in the open market, and people buy it. Uh, the meaning of this is that uh, gasoline or petrol or PMS, any name we call it, you know, is always more expensive than diesel or EGO. Uh, this is very basic fact in the in the oil and gas industry and the oil and gas markets. So anytime you see diesel selling at 280, you should expect that the petroleum spirit of petrol will sell at a price that is higher than this. Typically, maybe 10 naira more, uh, that will compensate for the difference between the value of uh, PMS and, and, and AGO. But what we see, because today NMPC is the sole importer of petroleum product, you know, and we're proudly saying as a company today that uh, uh, we have saved over a billion dollars of cost that would have been built in on the top of the cost of uh, importing petroleum product into this country by sheer fact that we have a much more robust, much more transparent uh, import pro process. Uh, we have a partnership and an arrangement that is uh, ensuring that uh, value is returned to the shareholder. That means uh, instead of having a value beyond 280 naira to the liter, we are delivering product to the pump today at 256. That means that there's a saving of over 30, 30 naira per liter because of the, uh, the transparent process that we are put in place, that we are taking out many things that ordinarily in the past were becoming the source of trouble for this country. I don't want to go into those details, all the subsidy issues that you are aware of. 
And the end result is that we're delivering this at our current cost, at the current exchange rate, probably around 200, which is in the last three days, uh, numbers, uh, if, I, if I replace it correctly. So uh, for us, uh, what they did, they wasn't cut it out of context, that's correct. Uh, uh, but what we are doing today in the market is selling at 116 naira to the liter. And these reasons are very, very obvious. Uh, as you're aware, uh, during the COVID-19, we announced as government the full deregulation of oil and gas PMS uh, sales uh, process. Uh, at that time, the, uh, the price of petroleum came down so drastically that we could sell at 125 naira to the liter and still recover our full cost. But over time, and after around September, the situation changed, the price of uh, crude oil and petroleum products changed uh, upwards. And the end result is that we got to a point where we crossed the 145 that was there before the COVID-19 troubles. And, and of course, uh, a number of series of events happened uh, at that point uh, around resistance from organized labor, civil society organizations, including other stakeholders. And more particularly, Mr. President himself was not convinced that uh, we have done enough to ensure price stability before moving into that environment of food deregulation. So those conversations are going on mm -hmm. to see how we can have the best framework that will ensure uh, prices are normalized uh, so that ordinary people are not further into any any danger or any exploitation that is unnecessary bearing in mind that you know we've done significant uh, uh significant efforts to make sure that delivery prices are the price that is best and is at the least cost that is possible okay uh, and of course uh, at the end of it all uh, the conversation will will go through and we'll see how this will turn out in the in a couple of months three four months i don't know what exactly the timeline will be but i know that there are engagements that are going on and part of that engagement process we haven't concluded in this and therefore, until you are able to resolve those issues and, and move forward, you, you're not able to tell you that this is at the right price that we want to sell tomorrow. Okay. Uh, so uh, that leads into the question I was going to ask for the teeming masses of Nigerians who, you know, your shareholders, you know, as you said. But uh, I was going to ask how stable the 162 Naira uh, is uh, over, you know, the short to medium term. But I think you sort of uh, answered that, that uh, it's a working process. Uh, it, uh, can, can Nigerians say that um, we have 162 and we can plan on 162, or is it likely to go up anytime soon? No, there's no debt on it. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, I believe that by the end of business day today, the Honorable Minister of State of Petroleum will announce that we'll have no change to the prices in July. I'm not sure if it's done yet, but I know it is so. I'm sure he's going to announce that uh, on behalf of government. So. Obviously, uh, there are long, long conversations that are required. Uh, it's not what I can tell you will happen tomorrow, but definitely it will happen tomorrow. There are engagements that are going on. I can't put the time frame on it, but obviously uh, it's not something that uh, anyone should worry about at this point in time. There are still long, long engagements that are required to make sure that everybody is aligned around this and for us to see the reality that uh, uh, we cannot continue to sustain this framework. Uh, we can't afford it in the long term, but obviously... Uh, you do also need the discipline to, to make sure that no one is exploited. The prices that you pay at the end of the day is the best of prices that is possible. And what NMPC is doing today, that is delivering at the best of price that is possible in the market, which, will, which is clearly demonstrated by the fact that you buy diesel at 2.8 in the market. And when you access the price, the petroleum to the ad market will come somewhere around 256 to about that number. So that means that delta is the saving that must be preserved. Uh, so that there's an efficiency in the delivery system. Otherwise, the market forces will come to play. And of course, uh, the, the trading community, you know, of course, it's not NGO work, and uh, it's an opportunity. As soon as demand is high, you see prices will go up. So we're doing everything to preserve that value for the ordinary people, and, and that's what is keeping us from making that decision. Very, 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 okay, very briefly, Malam, you explained how um, uh, 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 this whole matter of 280 naira per liter for, you know, AGO, um, that nowhere really does it uh, occur apart from maybe here uh, where you know AGO is uh, I mean costing uh, what it is and PMS is not uh, higher than that so how did we arrive at that situation where we're paying the high price of 280 uh, for you know uh, diesel and um, 162 which you said seems to be something a bit unique to Nigeria how did we arrive at that situation yes the, there are two reasons Number one reason is the uh, exchange rate. Uh, today, diesel is fully deregulated. Uh, the provision of FX, FX for uh, foreign exchange uh, for, for import of AGO is also uh, deregulated. What it means is that uh, uh, importers have the option of either waiting for the uh, appropriate uh, placement by the Central Bank of Nigeria or source of FX from, from commercial banks. 
and those rates are very different from what we NMPC is uh, uh, is uh, placed to to deliver on. So uh, that exchange rate is one factor. The second factor is the sheer efficiency or the transparency of the process that we have in process. Today we have a framework what we call the direct sale direct purchase process. Uh, in context, I can tell you that uh, six years ago, before the advent of this government, there are premiums that we pay for co customers that deliver product to us. Uh, and the delta, the difference between what was happening and what we're doing today is close to about a billion dollars of, uh, of cost uh, to the consumers every every year. So when you spread this and the impact of XX, that's why you can see NMPC's price will be at the pump will be around 256 naira to, to, to the leader. So, to the leader. so as long as you have a fully regulated market, you know, those factors will come to play. And and the mere presence of NMPC, which will continue to supply some part of those supply, even after post, uh, the regulation will balance the market and may ensure that uh, we're able to maintain this structure. Okay. And as we do this also, it aligns the process around the AGO uh, pricing. Uh, we know that the 280 may not be the actual market price. Uh, there are supply shocks that uh, we, have, we have noticed, uh, which has resulted in, in, in customers struggling for volume data. So customers, uh, is, is a demand and supply balance issue. While the realities are on ground, but they are, once there is supply uh, ex expectation, people jack up the price. But you can see that it has started coming down also. So it, it's really a demand and supply balance issue. Okay. much more than anything else okay. but for us uh, uh, we are taking the value from uh, from traders and giving it to nigerians and that's why you're seeing that difference but okay. obviously in a full first full regulation environment it is impossible to have uh, the price of pms uh, to be lower than that of uh, that of ago they will balance out over time but ultimately that reality will pay out because in the international market they're always priced differently and AGO is always cheaper than PMS. Okay, Malam, harking back to the um, the question of taking equity in uh, uh, Dangote, just harking back to it, uh, what, what what is the update on uh, refineries, uh, the refineries that we have? Uh, I, I t fully take your explanation that countries, Nigeria not accepted, needs to be in a powerful, uh, if not dominant position as far as this kind of a commodity is concerned. But um, give us a report on the Potakot worry and um, Kano refinery you know, uh, projects. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, two things are happening. Um, the energy transition conversation that is going on globally is actually around uh, put, making sure that carbon footprints are being brought to the lowest minimal possible. Uh, they call it, we call it carbon uh, zero carbon um, uh, situation. It doesn't mean there will be no carbon emission. It means that your activities in the fossil fuel industry is balanced by your activities that in the non-fossil fuel in industry, and in such a way that even your activities in the oil and gas industry uh, emit less of carbon, so that ultimately you have a zero uh, anil effect. It doesn't mean banishing of um, uh, fossil fuel or petroleum. Uh, it means that you know the uses will change. More efficiencies will be created in combustion, internal combustion engines. More alternatives will be created. Electric vehicle, which will also be driven by batteries. Of course, we know that battery casing. All of us know that battery casings are, are plastics. Plastics are made from petroleum. So the uses will change over a period of time. So, but the reality today is that uh, we are very, very uh, uh, we are a developing country. Uh, our infrastructure gap is so huge. Uh, so much effort is going investment. The reality is that poverty is much higher here than most countries that are fully transiting into a, almost a net zero uh, fossil fuel em environment. So we know for sure that in the next 20 years, you know, you will still continue to need petroleum here, even as a, as a matter of use for uh, automobile, as an automobile fuel. So that's why we're taking position to fix our refineries. Uh, uh, we admit that uh, we haven't done well in the last 20 years or so. We don't want to lament, but the reality is that uh, we haven't done well uh, keeping those refinery running. And that's why we change the whole model. Uh, it's no longer uh, a turnaround maintenance. Uh, the risk of being pedestrian is what, what you, a turnaround maintenance means something like taking a car to, to a garage every month to, to, to services. Let me use the Nigerian part as a service, you change engine oil filters and a few things, and they continue to run. Mm. But when you have a refinery that you're not able to keep well, uh, it continues to deteriorate, just like you are, if you refuse to change your brake parts you know, for a long period of time, very soon it will affect the brake disc. And then and so on, and many things will happen. So that's really what happened to us. And we know what's wrong with this refinery today. And as that means we are doing a rehabilitation. We have issued the APC contract to one of the most renowned APC contractors in the industry uh, through a very comprehensive tender process, a very transparent tender process, uh, unprecedented. We're actually dragging every other non-party non, non -party to this, uh, including transparency 
uh, organizations, uh, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Panos, everyone that should know about what we are doing. And ultimately, we come up with the, the contractor that is uh, selected by a process that is most transparent. And, and contractors are already mobilized to the site, we will deliver on this project. And concurrent to this, we are also awarding the Warrior and Cardinal Refinery uh, EPC contracts uh, during July. And the meaning of this is that they will run concurrently. We have learned from our mistakes in Fortaco. So these two processes will run concurrently and will deliver, able to deliver this. At the back of this, uh, we're also conscious of the, the quick wins that we can do the real, uh, because of the, the enormous condensate resources that we have in this country. Condensates are out of the open quota. Uh, you can produce it. And what we did is to see a line of uh, sight around about 200,000 barrels of condensate to be converted into gasoline through some condensate refinery initiative. We're not going to do it ourselves. We'll have partnership in one of the partnership, two of the partnerships, sorry. Uh, we're going to have take final investment decision in the next uh, uh, next month or two. Uh, the implication of this is that you're going to have production of more gasoline and other light products from this condensate refinery. The Dangote Refinery Initiative, which will probably not be part owners of that company, will also come on stream probably in 2022. That's the estimate that we have. And by the time we also fix our refinery, uh, at the same time frame, that is about in 18 months, we'll be able to have start having seen production. We'll complete the whole process over a period of 14 months. Uh, because refinery, you know, rehab, as you may be aware, you can actually do them in phases. You can start production without completing the rehab work. But that's how it is done. You do it the phase by the plant by plant, and then ultimately, so that you can start creating value well ahead of the completion of the process itself. Okay. Net effect, at the end of the day, this country is going to be a net effect of petroleum product, and we have a big picture. We can see what will happen. And we are supporting very many other small modern refining initiatives, not in terms of the equity, equity in it, but we have a responsibility to provide, provide them this stock, give them all the support that they need, a requirement. We give them a platform for transportation as we are working on our pipeline, for the pipeline network. So mm -hmm. uh, this country will, will derive the value. If you say, is it today? No, absolutely not possible for today. Is it in the short term very visible? Yes, it is. And uh, uh, see that we'll look backwards in probably next maximum uh, 18, 20 months that we'll come back and say, yes, we've done well. Okay. Uh, Malam, uh, earlier when you were speaking about um, the objective of a zero carbon uh, uh, footprint, it reminded me of, the, uh, of your earlier, uh, that, that is the NMPC zero remittance uh, uh, protect, uh, projection. I think it was uh, the, the projection of zero remittance to um, uh, FAAC, that is the um, Federal uh, Accounts Allocation Committee. Um, that zero remittance, it was a projection. Is it, yeah, did it become a fact? Yes, it is. Uh, I think it's a, it's a miscommunication. Uh, what was trending in social media and in the public space is that there's a communication between us and the Federation Allocation and Account, Accounts Allocation Committee. Uh, uh, telling them of a forecast of what we see coming uh, in the next two, three months. Uh, this is very normal. It's part of our governance and our processes are part of our responsibility to inform uh, the fact of what, what to expect. Uh, but what is not obvious uh, is that uh, our job is to ensure that production of oil and gas is sustained. We are accounting for about 80% of total production on behalf of the Federation. Our partnerships, either in the joint venture or the production sharing contract arrangement, some of our service contracts uh, deliver value and once you produce oil and you sell it, you must pay petroleum profit tax, and then you also must pay royalty. So those two streams will be impacted by your ability to produce at the best cost. Uh, and then that's one chain of uh, revenue that comes to the Federation account from the oil and gas. The other leg is what comes directly for the, from the NMPC. The Federation is aware that for you to produce so that taxes and royalties are paid, you know, you, meet, you need to bear the cost. So that cost is comes from the net revenues that is available to the to the to the, NM, to the NMPC. You have to take out the cost of production, which will facilitate production and, and revenue so that you can pay your taxes and royalties, and also to continue to sustain your other other operations. So whatever is left becomes the balance that is usually described as NMPC's remittance to the Federation mm -hmm. account. Mm -hmm. And that's what was said zero. So zero can come happen when your cost for your, your cash call uh, is settled and then you have to deal with the realities around the cost of petroleum which is the difference between the market price and what we're doing today so there's no other way of doing it than to treat it as your cost in the short term while all other appropriation steps are taken but once you do this and then it becomes huge as the price of petroleum rises uh, that value becomes much higher and higher and then what we would have done which is we're expected actually to in basic terms to deliver 120 billion up uh, every month to the federation account will not be practical because it will be eaten out by 
the realities of the subsidy regime and other costs that are associated with it. So when you say zero, it doesn't mean zero. Zero means that you're able to meet your cost and you're also able to ensure that production is sustained so that the taxes and royalties will continue to flow. T tell us, Malam, about um, your efforts in NNPC at um, uh, transparency and accountability. Usually it is thought that oil industries generally, it's a very secretive affair. Uh, just talk to us about that, especially against the backdrop of our acquiring shares and having to pay for those shares. I've heard that we might be approaching banks. Uh, could you just wrap all of that into uh, transparency you know, and accountability? <coughs> Yes, thank you very much. You see, um, uh, we are aware that the whole world thinks the oil and gas industry, in, in a wider sense, is a very opaque industry. And opaque means that people don't know what we are doing. And in our case here, uh, NMPC, over the last uh, 20, 10, 30 years, you know, you know, every time you have conversation around NMPC, our shareholders, which is 100%, uh, by 200 million Nigerians today, uh, will think that we are not telling them what we are doing. And we determined that the best way to do is to make sure that your shareholders know what you are doing. And there's no better way of expressing your, your oppressions than through your financial statement. It tells you everything, how well you are doing, what business is doing well, which is not doing well, what costs have you incurred. So what we did as a strategic decision is to publish our audited financial statement for 2018, 2019. I will do so for 2020. Wow, wow, wow. Very huge cost, yes, uh, because uh, what it did is three of where we are not doing well, People can see through what our operations are going on. People can also see that we're able to uh, make changes that are beneficial to all of uh, our country. Put it in the context, you know, you will see that if you look at our accounts for 2018, and our losses are about 800 billion. Uh, we're able to, by sheer commitment and the act of the transparency that we're putting in place, we're able to cut down that losses to less than three, about three billion in our 2019 accounts. If you check it, you will see this. And this year, we, we know for sure that uh, we'll break even, we'll also de declare dividend, all things being equal to our, to, our, to our shareholders. So the first step is to declare your financial statement, which we did. And secondly, our transaction with the Federation, uh, which is in the form of the petroleum, of all sorts that we sell, gas, uh, petroleum liquids, on behalf of the Federation, that every... Okay, it froze on us, but it's going to loosen, I hope, uh, because um, our guest is uh, Malam Mele uh, Kolokiari, the group MD of um, NNPC. And um, he's been telling us about movements, developments, projections in the um, NNPC. We hope we can get him again, not least of all, so that we can properly uh, disengage. Um, so. Uh, in fact, um, uh, in fact, we uh, a pastor even called in while the GMD was speaking. Uh, he, he's still there, uh, uh, Pastor. Uh, thank you very, very much for uh, holding on. Um, maybe get your question in now. Thank you, Uncle Yori. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Yeah. Um, good morning, uh, Malikiari. Yeah. There is very important discussion about our life, about our country. And um, I think this clearly shows how serious we are in the business of governance. Presently, the rate of buying fuel in the country is too outrageous, and it's affecting virtually every sphere of life, beginning with transportation of goods and products, and even going to work and other things. But now, as we speak, we are still talking about Dangote refinery and others. From one administration to the other, we keep hearing about the awarding of the uh, 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 refinery. Okay. Now, my uh, question, a question. Do you have a question for Malam Kiari? Yes. Yes. Okay. My question to Malam Kiari is now is that how soon are we going to get our refinery working to reduce the unnecessary cost of buying fuel in the country? Okay. Thank you. Um, Malam Kiari, did you hear that question from our viewer? Yes, yes, I, yes I did. Uh, thank yeah. you very much, Pastor. Um, I think I, I appreciate the concern and the, and the perspective that you're coming from. Uh, first of all, uh, when you say you look, refine locally, let us get it very straight. When you, look, when you refine locally, what you are typically doing is to bring these products closest to its consumers. First of all, you're also creating other value in terms of creating employment and other uh, collateral value that you put on the table. But the difference between local refining and import is that you know you are going to take up the major difference you are going to take out the cost of freight. 
which in average it comes around 21 naira to every liter of petroleum that you bring. Because at the first instance, when you refine locally, you are going to take out at least 21 naira from your cost of uh, fuel, maybe 17 to 21. Some there because there are other costs, of course, they are even associated in local transportation of petroleum. So this is what it does to you, and that's the value that will come on on the table. And I've admitted uh, uh, very clearly that, uh, yes, we are making efforts. Uh, we haven't done well in you know, managing this refinery in the last 20, 25 years. Uh, we're making efforts to make sure about what is the contract for the rehabilitation of Portaco. We'll do the same for Portaco and Wari and Kaduna uh, shortly within July. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a process for making sure we deliver this. I also mentioned, if you recall, uh, if you are listening to me, I also mentioned that you know, in 18 months, uh, you'll see first uh, line of production coming up. We'll have a full, complete uh, uh, all round uh, rehabilitation completed, maybe in 40 months, but yeah, that's how refinery perhaps takes place. Uh, in the past, we shut down everything and stop uh, everything until the, everything is completed, but we're not going to do that. Uh, this process is a first project that will now continue. The value will be coming as you continue to do your work to completion, because I'm sure you know that some of the items that are required in a refinery rehabilitation, not turnaround maintenance, are long lead items. There mm -hmm. are things that you have to produce, uh, completely replace, they have to be manufactured, designs must take place, and so on. And so many things have changed. So, okay, Ma I Madam, Kiari, you. Madam Kiari, yes. I beg your pardon for interrupting you. We have another caller on the line, Mr. George in Lagos. Go ahead, Mr. George. Uh, good morning, Uncle Yari. Good morning, sir. And good morning to the uh, NNPC GMD. Uncle Yari, I'm good personally morning, not, uh, yeah, I'm uh, personally not uh, comfortable with the arrangement of uh, NNPC taking 20% shares of uh, Dangote uh, um, uh, refinery. Why am I saying so? Uncle Yori, this is NNPC that cannot manage our own refinery. This is NNPC that we know that um, all these reports have been ordered twice in that organization, and none of them have seen the light of the day. This is NNPC that has not been able to manage our uh, uh, pricing system of our products, that does not even monitor what goes on in, in the industry as far as the poor people that are, are using these products are concerned. The Dango Trade Group, I, I am aware that there is a consortium of banks that give them money for that project. How does the government just come at the tail end of it and say we want to be part of it. Why okay, Mr. George, Mr. George, I, I beg your pardon, Mr. George. Thank you very much. I've got to give the GMD a chance to react to those issues that you brought up. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I can understand uh, your, your concerns, uh, but obviously, uh, Mr. George, uh, I'm not going to say that uh, uh, we're doing everything we're doing is uh, absolutely uh, correct uh, in, in the sense that uh, Decisions you make today, the outcomes will come tomorrow. Uh, well, let me talk to speak to the, some of the issues that you have raised around audit reports. You know, there is no year you have less than five to six audit exercises around operations. And some of them are structurally, some of them are not. Some of them are the instance of the National Assembly, some of them uh, by law required under the EITI Act. And there is none of them, and particularly if you can just check, you will find out that the, all the EITI uh, audit exercises have been reported, have been published. Uh, so it is not absolutely correct that uh, they haven't come out, the reports have not taken. It's not two, it's more than two. We do have two, six or seven reports every year. And over the last 10 years that I can also recollect, you know, there are at least uh, 20 to 30 audit exercises conducted around NMPC's uh, business. And, and the outcomes are there. And always, uh, let me address what probably must have informed this view that you haven't seen the light of the day. What is always in all these reports is the cost of uh, petroleum subsidy. Uh, there's an expectation that uh, while we enjoy subsidies like we are doing today, all of us, including Mr. George, including you, uh, it is also expected that the full value of petroleum be returned into the federation account. It's impossible to eat your cake and have it. And I've always said this, that uh, this is the reality. We must make up our mind that we set up a subsidy regime I'm, on a, a fully regulated regime. Okay, I'm afraid I'm so going to have to jump in again. Okay. I beg your pardon, uh, Malam. The second one is a... Malam, is a Malam. Yes. Yes. I beg your pardon. I'm afraid I'm going to have to jump in because we've run out of time. And I wanted to ask you perhaps the all-important question of uh, when exactly will NMPC begin to deliver uh, uh, dividends, as it were, uh, to us shareholders, as you have referred to all Nigerians? 
Yes, I did. I think I mentioned this. Uh, we are waiting to complete our audit, uh, financial audit for, for 2020 uh, to be done in the next one month, uh, and we'll publish it. And the meaning of that publication and that completion of the process is to declare a dividend to Nigeria. We'll do it this year. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to have to leave it there, although there's so much more uh, because uh, NMPC and um, indeed that resource to Nigeria is all important and there's so many questions. Thank you very much, Malam uh, Mele Kolokiari, Group Managing Director of NMPT for NMPC for spending time with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Then. Okay. So uh, stay with us. The program continues. Um, we'll be right back. Stay with us, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much for staying with us if we've been from the beginning or for joining us uh, if you are just arriving, uh, um, you know, and right now uh, our guest is, um, we want to change the subject, Mazi uh, uh, Namdi Kano, leader of the proscribed um, independent people of uh, Baafra Pressure Group, you know, you know um, he uh, arrived the country and has actually been in court and uh, I have uh, with me here, Dr. Oyeka Chiubani, Chairman of Section of Public Interest and Development Law of MBA Spiddle. Uh, he's also the former uh, Vice President of MBA. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Oyeka Chi, for coming on the program. Thank you very much. Um, your, your, your comments on the, first of all, it took everybody by surprise. Everybody was shocked mm -hmm. yesterday, where well, most people were shocked yesterday to hear that Namdi Kanu was, in, 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 was back in the country. Mm -hmm. And he has immediately been uh, he has immediately resumed the court process that he you know, allegedly uh, abandoned uh, when he jumped bail, even though I have read that he said he hadn't jumped bail. But you, give me your thoughts, your comments. Yeah, it was a breaking news last year, yesterday. Somebody just called my attention to it that uh, Kano is back to the country. I said, how? Mm -hmm. Then I started uh, surfing the, <laughs> <laughs> the internet yeah. you know, to get information. Not much actually was... Uh, uh, deciphered from the not much from was released. The, yeah, from how he the, was from arrested, the press, exactly. when, you know. and of course I hear some people also complain. How was he extradited mm -hmm. uh, from from UK? Uh, because it's a legal process. Uh, but you know we need to now conjure. You know how Kano may have uh, actually come into the country. I think that what took place uh, is that uh, there is a collaborative effort between the internal security agencies here and Interpol abroad. And then uh, there's a difference when you are arrested, you know, from extradition. Extradition is a legal process, you know, so you have to follow a legal and it takes some time before a person can be extradited. But when you are arrested, hmm. it could be that he was placed on red alert by Interpol and they must have sufficient evidence from the Nigerian, the Nigerian government to say, okay, this man has committed these alleged crimes and we think he should come back to the country and whatever he is, arrest him and bring him back to jurisdiction. That may have been what played out, you know, because the Attorney General was very... He was very uh, vague. Very tacit. Very, you know? very, he very, was not... Uh, very, revi you know. He revealed nothing about... Mm. But, you know, in the days ahead, we will get to know... You know, I read some other funny stories. One said he was arrested in Brazil. Some other people say he went to go and see a woman in a hotel. And, uh, you know, for a matter of... Uh, you, can, you can trust the internet, yeah, internet you know, to, 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 to get in on the act. Beautiful. The so the, the good thing and the commendable aspect of the entire thing was the issue of taking him to the court. Straight ahead. Because there was a trial process that was on the, you know that was going on before the issue of bail. Now you took him straight to the court, so he's now detained at the instance of a pronouncement of a judge. Mm -hmm. That again is clear, you know that uh, the entire world will be watching what Nigeria is going to do with this particular case. There is a searchlight now beam on Nigeria as a country, internationally and nationally. So how they handle it, you know, will really you know uh, speak volume about the respect to rule of law you know, people's right and all that. So the best thing they did, and I, and I think that was the quality advice, take him straight to the court, let him be detained now at the stance of the court. So you remember what transpired? It is the woman that said, look, make sure that this information that he has been rearranged, you know, uh, is passed to the lawyers, the team of lawyers that is defending Kano, and then I am giving them opportunity you know, on, on between now and 26th of July, which is very critical because he must have sufficient time. And it's an accelerated hearing, as a matter of fact. Well, even, yes. even at that. Yeah, because even it was, was adjourned mm -hmm. uh, previously to sometime in October. 
But now, because of the fact that he is now in, in the country physically, so the judge now made a pronouncement that, okay, the matter will start now on 26th of July. You know, so, but the lawyers must be made aware to give them, it's a, it's a constitutional requirement that when you are charged for a crime, your team of lawyers and then you yourself, the accused, must be given sufficient time to prepare for your defense. So, I think that one month will give them sufficient time to get all their facts together. E even uh, yesterday, uh, when the news you know, hit that he was back in the country, yes. uh, apparently he had been in the country a few hours before mm, we got to hear right. about it. Uh, right. um, there are those that um, had you know, quietly expressed their apprehension, uh, fears, uh, concern, call it what you will, about you know, uh, Mazi Namdekano's safety. Um, yeah. You know, uh, that, mm. uh, you know, uh, that whole area, you, yeah. did you hear about that as well? Yes, I did. I did. Yeah. I, and of course, it's important uh, that the government of the Daza said earlier, the satellite of international, you know, communities now beamed on Nigeria. So how this matter, you know, is played out and handled, uh, you know, will, will actually speak volume about us, you know. So I think the government themselves, are, you know, they're going to be careful in handling the situation, make sure that he's safe, make sure that he's also normal, and then come and face his trial. He, there was a trial that was going on before this Indeed. issue of the whole thing. Uh, and then Nambi's kind of explanation is that, look, it's only a man that is alive that can face his trial. Mm -hmm. I had to run mm -hmm. because my life was not safe, you know, mm -hmm. so he escaped. He, he said he escaped he said, to safety. He said safety. Uh, and now, which he's and trying I, to I say is different from jumping bail. Beautiful. I also understand that even from his, his, you know, what he says from abroad, he says he's not afraid to come and face trial, but the government must guarantee his safety. That has always been his problem. Now that he's by, in, you know, arrest, he has been brought into the country so he has opportunity now you know to be ha to have his day in court so the prosecution now have to present the evidence of the alleged you know uh, 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 you know crime that he's, he has committed then he has a right now to respond whether there is any crime at all committed by him mm -hmm. and at the end the judge who's an impartial person will now mm -hmm. look at the evidence of mm -hmm. both the prosecution and that of the defense and then now whoever it's you know you know and it must be proved beyond reasonable doubt because proof in criminal jurisprudence is different from civil and uh, mm -hmm. namdekano was um, charged with um, a treasonable felony that, there is terrorism uh -huh. um, then treasonable felony mm -hmm. the issue of defamation and then the issue of incitement so many other things so now, even the attorney general was now mentioning that he, some of his activities are subversive of the authority of the of the state. You know, maybe they will amend the previous charge. Nobody knows. So between now and twenty six, we want to know what the government want to do. Are they going to add additional offenses, alleged offenses that he is uh, he has committed, or are they going to now you know based upon the previous uh, charges that has already before the court continue with the trial process? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, just to mention here that we had arranged to also be able to speak with uh, Dim Uche Okuku, uh, who is uh, deputy Pres uh, president general or has it or her. Ohaneze Ndigo, um, mm -hmm. you know, he will be joining us as soon as it is uh, technically possible. Mm -hmm. We'll be speaking just before uh, coming on air. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so, um, but, uh, Reverend Dominic, uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, Yori. Good morning, uh, Baris Obani. Yeah, Reverend, how are you? Morning. Yeah, Yori, I, I'm not sad, I'm not happy. I don't know my emotion this morning, but let me say this. Yori, I've said this several times that if the elders of political elders of the north economic elders of the north and the politicians in the north make up their mind to end boko haram it will end yesterday not today now join it what happened for you to arrest a man that is in a foreign land whether it's in brazil or london for you to arrest him without a leakage to show that if we put our mind to things we can make nigeria work so the way we handle that the will be a different thing but we must we go back to history. Boko Haram came to us, maybe not before the time we expected, because the man who was provocating it as an activist was killed on a questionable manner, Yusuf, as if I remember his name. Now, we must put it here. This man was handled with care, because I know his followers have been rattled. How could you catch him like a thief like this and handcuff him? So what I'm trying to say, if we could resolve this matter to arrest this man abroad, why is that it? Designing exile they have been applied as for Zobane. That application to brother design exile here, who have been judged as a criminal because property have been seized, his uh, money have been seized and traded. So it's no more alleged. It's alleged he stole Nigerian money. And we apply for her to come out of UK and it's difficult. Mm. For you to bring Nazi cars just a few days ago. As easy as it were, okay. we can bring Boko Haram and ban it as easy as that if we agree to end it. Thank you.
All right, then. Thank you very much for calling in. Mm -hmm. um, he linked one thing to another, another yeah. uh, but also pointing out that why the linkage is that if indeed we want to, by we, of course, the authorities, the powers that be, yes. want to achieve an objective, yeah. uh, this incident shows that it is indeed achievable. achievable. But where is the will to do that mm -hmm. which needs to be done? Mm -hmm. So that will has been shown, I think, is implying in the case of Namdi Khan yes. now. Mm -hmm. uh, how about other uh, equally important... Um, in instances. What he's saying is that we should be efficient in all things we do. Uh, we have had incidences, I mean, uh, trouble in the, in the Northeast, and, and then we are also aware that there are certain people that are behind all this. And we are having problem in the Southeast, and of course, Nam Dekano is alleged to be linked uh, to the crisis in the, in the East. And now you have which deployed... Which he has denied as well. Yeah, which he has denied anyway. But now you have deployed all manner of efficiency. Mm -hmm. And then all manner of... You are, you are steady about it. You continued, you know, to ensure that you, 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 you get him and you brought him back. You know, meaning that if you want to stop some of the other, you know, things, you know, that are lingering over time, you could also, you know, deploy the level of efficiency you have also put into this, you know. So I, I, I think that is what people have been saying. I also have been reading social media, and I see the reaction of people that if we can get Kano, yes. we can also get all those who have been causing so much That's problem. The because we are spending so much billions in trying to pacify what is going on in the North. You know, and, the, and nobody says it, you know, the level of... Uh, Government commitment, you know, in the South is it, especially in terms of insecurity. They are not paying the same similar. That is the allegation. So government also must be listening to what Nigerians are saying regarding this. So, as I said earlier, it's now a judicial process. Get everyone that is troubling this nation, you know, uh, to a, a table, which is what I'm going to say before I leave here. What is happening now is the government needs a little bit being to be circumspect, to be a bit more cautious, and then let the wisdom of God come in. Because we need peace in this country. We can't develop without peace. So that peace process must begin. Now, having brought Nam the Kano to jurisdiction, yes. we can engage everyone, including uh, Sunday, we, who, we, who, even the Northern people who are so because almost everyone is agitated in this country. Okay. We can all have a round table to discuss our common problem and find a peaceful and lasting solution to our problem. We can't develop this nation in the absence of peace. Okay. Uh, mm. Mazio Okorafo, good morning, sir. Mazio Okorafo, in Arochuku. It is technology. Oh. <laughs> Mazi, I was told Mazi is on the That's line. On the line yeah. uh, Mazi Okorafo in Arochuku. Okay. Um, there must be a, a technical issue. A We're call. still expecting, even if it is just a little time, to be able to be... See, uh, uh, what you are seeing today in Nigeria is a welcome to oh, Mazi came through. But the question now is this. If you take 80% of reports from Nigerians, they will ask you, the, all these... Uh, Internal criminals within Nigeria, the terrorists are kidnappers and things. What does it take us to mm. track these ones? Mm -hmm. But we track the one after Nigeria. But the question is this the Nigeria security agencies, whether Interpol or DSS, anyone we may call them, they have a lot to do. A lot to do in the sense that Nigerians are ready to cooperate with any authority to make sure that we bring down all these. Uh, 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 since the problem of anarchy, name them, many to may call them. But the question is this, the way forward. The federal government should do as the need for. The judicial system that we have in Nigeria, they should put it in order. So that we will now follow the sequence in terms of cases. So that Nigeria will follow the sequence so that we know exactly what is happening. Now, we have seen that they said that, that what the barrister was saying them, that and the government will not have to add another charges, maybe he just has gone or this and But the thing is that the judicial system has to put that so that between now and December, they will destroy the case. Because in Nigeria, we have cases, issues that to be done. Uh, okay, Mazi. One will come, they will explain, they say, it's not healthy. The earlier they handle this case sequentially, the better for us, so that we know the situation, what is happening. Because if Nigerian government has the Go around inside the, uh, the Zambisa. What does it take us if we can track this one from outside Nigeria? It is a lesson that the federal government should give us. What will it take them to track down what is happening in, in the uh, uh, Zambisa forest? Thank you very much. Have a blessed day in Lagos. Indeed. Thank you very much uh, for calling in. Um, so, uh, going back, and you've addressed the matter mm -hmm. about. Uh, people, uh, all eyes now being on the authorities, mm. Nigerian authorities. Yeah. You, you got Namdi Kano, you know, he, he, he jumped bail, so he was a fugitive. So uh, and, and 
Well, yes, mm. that, that's the allegedly. Yeah. Yes, that's why he's been absent mm. for how many months now? Uh, almost, a, almost a year. Two there years you now, go. Two years. Yeah, um, so, 2017. There you go. Uh, uh, that's jumping bail as far as uh, non-legal minds might be concerned. Okay, fine. L legal people might see it differently. Yeah, fine. So, but now he he he's back and um, uh, well, okay, Mr. George. Good morning, again. Yes. Good morning, Kiyori. Okay. Hello, I can hear you. Good yes, morning. please, please go ahead. You yes, might, you uh, might be uh, our last uh, caller. Yes, greetings to Mr. Barney, too. Yeah. I, I, okay. I, I, I talked about this issue a few days ago, uh, Uncle Yori, if you remember, that government should make effort to uh, address the cost. I'm happy at what the government has done to uh, repatriate the corporate and to make him to face the music. I'm surprised that uh, some, of, uh, some people are, are making statements to insinuate that the government is deliberately not uh, tackling Boko Haram. Uh, now if he can arrest uh, Nandi Kano, why can't he arrest uh, the leader of Boko Haram? They are not the same, but I don't want to be, uh, uh, I'm not government lawyer, uh, government lawyer, but even if you have four problems and you are able to solve one, is that not, is that not progress? Mm -hmm. That does uh, uh, face the issue. Do, okay. Does it mean some people like the insecurity in the east? Okay, all right. I, anyway, I, I, the same uh, thing. Whether it's in the east or in the north or in the south or, or the west, insecurity is insecurity. When government is able to do one, you commend them, and then you uh, encourage them to go to the next and tackle it. All right, then, uh, Mr. George, I beg your pardon, got to interrupt because um, we're fast running out of time. But so we'll just take that as um, a, a comment. You mm. know, this, this, this is a comment. It, it yeah. wasn't a question, yeah. it was yeah. a comment fine, on, fine. on what's going on. Now, now, the issue now is that uh, uh, I don't know whether his team of lawyers will renew uh, any application for his bail. And mm -hmm. now the court have to look at the, the circumstances mm -hmm. and the facts of the case. Of course, the prosecution will come with the idea look, he has John Bell, that is. Uh, is going to be is going to be the idea, not the fact. Uh, yeah, what well, is 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 to them they will present that fact <laughs> that he jumped bell that shouldn't okay. be, and then okay. the court now will now be in a position to either to make a, a pronouncement as to accelerated hearing, you know, while you know we've been in detention, or to grant him bail further. Now, for uh, Senator Abaribe, now he's going to be free if he wants to. He can excuse himself and get probably his money that has been forfeited, mm -hmm. you know, and all that, you know, because it wasn't a criminal offence. For you to stand shorty for an absconding uh, accused person is not a criminal offence, it's a civil, you only forfeit your bail bond. Now, all the things we play about, the most important thing is that the federal government must uh, adhere to rule of law, to respect to right, and then ensure that the judiciary be allowed to do its independent uh, uh, duty in accordance with the law. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm afraid Very we're going to have to leave it there, simply Thank because you. of time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's the situation on that. Um, uh, again, so sorry that we couldn't uh, actually get Dim Uche Okuku, uh, you know, the Deputy President General of Ohanese Indigo. Indigo that was scheduled to speak with us as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nyekachi Ubani, Chairman of the Section Thank of you, Public uh, Interest and uh, Development Law of MBA. Speedo. I Speedo. think I'll just be saying Speedo yeah, from just now on. For, you know, to, <laughs> long. Thank you very much very for coming on. Mm. So that's our program. Please join us tomorrow for a fresh edition. I am Iori Fulani. Bye-bye for now.